Good morning, everybody. Uh, Chris Dames here. Hope you're doing well. Welcome to this episode of Savello Live. Uh, if I look really pixelated, uh, uh, apparently uh, producer Ross has told me that um, uh, we're having some technical issues this morning. And even though it looks fine on my side, uh, I may be coming to you as a 1980s style pixel uh, uh, image. Uh, apologies for that. Hopefully you can hear me fine. We've decided to uh, give it a go anyway to, to make sure that we share the information we want to share and it's really useful. Um, there's a few things that we want to talk about on today's Savello Live. And typically on Savello Live, we have a guest. Um, uh, unfortunately, our guest has uh, cancelled um, uh, and you've just got little old me. But hopefully we're going to share some really useful stuff uh, that's going to help you with your financial plan, help you make sure that you're making really good financial decisions for your future and effectively just share some really useful information that helps you, uh, informs you, guides you, uh, and is is good. Now, Raz has just told me that the picture's looking better. I'm not pixelated, so that's that's good to know. Uh, but we are a live show. We'd love to hear your comments. If you're watching on Facebook, on LinkedIn, wherever you're watching, if you put a comment uh, anywhere near the screen, uh, anywhere on the comments below i can see that um uh, and we'd love to share your thoughts because we want to make this as interactive as possible uh now what i'm going to do is um share some slides that we've done uh now uh Raz, feel free now to share the slides so you can so uh, everybody watching on linkedin and facebook can see this couple of things that i want to do initially though is ask you a question so question of this live is i think that's what qotl stands for i didn't build this presentation but question of this live what is your number one money tip what one tip would you share with our audience to uh, help them get better with money uh, I've got a bunch of money tips that that we always share, and some that some we're going to be sharing uh, today. But what is your number one money tip? What's the one thing that you've done recently that's changed how you look at money? And and that money tip might be a a, a mindset thing, or it might be something really practical. But I'd love to hear on this. Uh, particular presentation what your money tip is so feel free to put that in the comments um, and we'll share that with our audience we'd love for you to to get involved and what i'd love for you to do um is um is ask me a question you know i'm here to help on this sort of half hour 45 minute live if you've got any financially i mean Let's be clear. The remit of my pr uh, professional advice is, is fairly limited to uh, financial planning. Um, if you ask me questions about your relationship or um, something a little more esoteric, I don't know whether I'm going to be professionally qualified to give you an answer. However, if you've got a money conversation or, or a money question and you'd like my thoughts and opinion on it, feel free to ask because uh, I'm here to help. So... So that that that's where I want to go with this. Um, firstly, uh, I want to talk about something that came up in the news last week about changes in um, workplace pension funds. Um, and Raz, if you can stop sharing that presentation for me, so I'm full screen again. Um, what and effectively what this change is is something that uh, the Chancellor's brought out. So I want to read you a little news article so you've got a, uh, a bit of an understanding of what's going on, and then just talk about some of the elements that you need to be aware of, and actually you need to be slightly uh, cautious of when you're thinking about financial financial plan. So Jerry Hunt uh, unveiled pension fund reform, reforms designed to help UK startups. So the Chancellor has outlined some proposals uh, in what is called his mansion house speech. Um, and he, effectively what he said is that if you've got a workplace pension and a, a bunch of different pension providers have already agreed to this, if you've got a workplace pension, 
Um, the amount of money that those workplace pensions commit to UK startups is actually going to be uh, a lot more. So uh, it's confirmed that the Treasury struck a deal with nine of the largest pension providers that result in firms earmarking 5% of retirement funds towards private investments. Now, the majority of pension money at the minute goes uh, goes towards large global investments, uh, public companies. What he's looking at is making deals with nine of the big pension providers so that 5% of those pots go to private investments. The government will create new investment vehicles that would give future retirees a stake in homegrown private companies, including fast-growing fintech and biotech startups that have been increasingly snubbed by the London Stock Exchange and turned to foreign investors for cash. The reforms are meant to support wider government plans to attract more business investment and come months after Hutton reiterated his ambitions for the UK to become the next Silicon Valley. Um, whilst the UK's auto enrolment programme has made workplace uh, pension contributions compulsory for most employees, Hunt believes investment opportunities are being missed. I disagree with the Chancellor here. And the reason that I disagree with the Chancellor is 5% of a portfolio in unlisted UK companies is a lot, um, particularly when your financial plan is based on investments in these companies, a large majority of which fail. Now, clearly, um, I get the incentives in terms of why Jeremy Hunt's doing that. His incentive is to boost the economy. Um, and certainly these companies, uh, uh, these startup companies, a minority become really large businesses. They become unicorns but actually a decent chunk of them fail. So I get why Jeremy Hunt is doing this. I get the motivations behind it. My concern is that if it comes to your financial plan, are you happy and are you comfortable with 5% of your investment portfolio being risked, because the risk of investing in these companies is higher, uh, being risked in these sort of investments. Now, you might be. You might be more than happy and comfortable with making these investments. Um, but you need to be aware that this change is happening because if you're invested in a default fund where your money just typically goes, in a workplace pension, these changes are, are going to be happening. Um, and, and being aware of that allows you to then make an informed decision about whether you want those money, your your money, your hard-earned pension money that you're saving for your financial future, invested in these sort of things. Uh, Tom Selby made a comment. Uh, Tom Selby, the head of retirement policy at the broker AJ Bell, cautioned uh, that the fall of star fund manager Neil Woodford, who invested heavily in private companies, which were difficult to sell off quickly, showed the challenges big investments in illiquid assets, and private companies typically are illiquid assets, whereas publicly traded companies you can buy and sell really re re fairly easily. Uh, private companies selling shares in them, it's close and closed market and you're in a position where it's a lot more difficult to invest um the big challenges are the challenges big investments in liquid assets can have and investors will not thank the government if this policy hits the values of their retirement pots now jeremy hunt said that he thinks he believes that this will add i think he said a thousand pounds a year um to uh to, to pension pots uh, for UK retirees. That number, uh, and I, I haven't seen the predictions it's based on, feels like pure speculation to me because there's so many variables that could have an impact on that. So here's what you need to do, okay? You need to, um, if you've got a workplace pension that's in a default fund, you need to understand a bit about where that money's invested in today and whether it's right for you. But also bear in mind that the, um, assuming that that you know the treasury is struck a deal with these with these nine um, with it, with these nine large uh, pension companies, understand how those um, 
changes are going to impact your plan personally. And that starts with you having a financial plan, having a clear, robust financial plan, understanding what your life looks like if you never ran out of money again. And then that strategy and then tactics is looking at these pension pots and make sure the investment is aligned to achieving that goal. Now, clearly, uh, the, the, the right thing to do in, in this response is just to follow some clear investment rules. They're really easy. Number one, try and get costs low. I've got a feeling that uh, investments in smaller uh, private companies will actually increase the cost of uh, workplace pensions. Don't know what's happening yet, but I've got a feeling that's going to recur. Number two is uh, globally diversify. So, you know, this is primarily, these moves are primarily used to boost, bolster the UK. I get why the Chancellor, the UK Chancellor would do that. Uh, when we're advising our clients, it's important to have really good, diversified global spread. Um, and having too much in the UK might be a risk to that. And get the balance right between your comfort level with risk and the rewards you're looking to achieve. Um, and I think that's probably my greatest concern with these proposals. The fact that actually people will be sleepwalking effectively because they're going to be invested in a default fund through the workplace pension, sleepwalking into these proposals without a really good, robust understanding of what they mean um, is, is a bit of a concern to me. So, so just be aware of it. Just be aware that, that it's happening. Um, just be aware that uh, if you've got a default fund in a workplace pension, now is the time to review it. It's always a good time to review your financial plan, but now is a good time to review your workplace pension. And we're in a position where uh, you it, it's the right time to do it uh, now. So that that's part one. Just be aware of those proposals. It's really important. For you to, to be aware of them. Um, and now what I'm going to do is move on to uh, just some content that we shared on uh, Cervelo, the Cervelo website, www.cervelofp.co.uk. Uh, now, I appreciate as a financial planner that um, it's not always right for uh, people to come and have a conversation with me. As a service, uh, we think we're really good value, but uh, we're only good value for the right um, individual in the right situation. And certainly what I'm keen on doing is making sure we share information. It's part of our do well, do good philosophy. We share information where even if you don't need somebody like me, you're doing some stuff that's going to support your financial plan today. So I want to talk about five things you can do for absolutely free uh, that, that will help you uh, track your financial plan. Um, so number one is keep a track of income and expenses. I don't, I'm working from home today, and I don't know if you can hear that, but there seems to be uh, an alarm. Normally when I'm hosting my podcast, uh, uh, the dog starts barking, and he might. So keep an ear out for that. So what are the five things you can do for free to boost your financial plan today? Number one is track income and expenses. So having a really good understanding of where your money's coming from and where your money goes sounds really simple, then allows you to work out what you're spending, how you're spending, and what changes you can make to those patterns. I'm uh, I'm a fan at the moment of the Starling app. So I've got a personal Starling bank account. Uh, it's um, amazing because what it allows you to do, it effectively automates that process for me. And it will give me a little pie chart to say, here's what you've spent on X, here's what you've spent on meals, on holidays. And I use it for personal spending only. Uh, meals, holidays, um, uh, cinema, you know, it'll break it all down in a really useful pie chart and they help me understand where I get enjoyment from the spending and how much I'm spending on and where I don't. Um, I, uh, I, I'd certainly recommend one of the, one of the things that I enjoyed watching quite recently was uh, uh, Diary of a CEO. Uh, with the author of I Can Teach You To Be Rich. Now, there were some elements of that show where 
Um, I disagreed with him on as a professional advisor, but a lot of the stuff that he talked about, and this is why it's worth watching, a lot of the stuff he talked about was really, really useful because he talked about the fact that uh, true wealth isn't about the amount of money we've got in the bank. It's about living the life we want with the money we've got and getting that balance right. And uh, he made a really interesting point that I've never thought about before um, around thinking about money in terms of uh, thinking about money in terms of spending money on stuff you love and then mercilessly cutting costs on the bits that don't add any value to their life. Now, I don't know. Uh, I'm I'm never probably going to go to that extreme, uh, but certainly being conscious of what you spend, keeping track of income and expenses is a really useful tool to work out uh, what changes you might need to make. The other thing, tracking income, the other reason tracking income and expenses is really useful, I think, is because effectively, when we're building a financial plan for our clients, and we use a tool called Cashflow to do that, when we build a financial plan for our clients, what we typically do is try and future plan. So if you were financially independent, how much is enough? How much would you need to make sure that you're never going to run out of money again? So working out how much income you've got and how much you spend then allows you to turn around and go, well, if I'm spending this today um, and actually my mortgage is going to be gone by the time I'm financially independent or I won't be paying for the kids' education anymore, although uh, when the kids get older, don't assume that's ended. That's my personal experience point. Um, uh, is make sure that you're in a position where... Uh, you're you're taking those bits off, but factor in the fact that when you are financially independent, you may choose to spend your time differently. So you may be choosing to spend more time traveling. Uh, you may be choosing to spend more time doing the things you love that come at cost. So effectively, what having a really clear understanding of income and expenditure allows you to do is not only look at what you can change today, but also plan better for your future. So those two elements are really useful. I mean, you can do it on a pad, piece of paper, spreadsheet, apps. There's loads and loads of tools out there available to do that. But that's one thing you can do for free, track your income and expenses. One thing that I'd recommend you do, and I use experience to do this, but there's other, there's, um, other uh, things available to do this, is uh, review credit report. So... It's an important tool, gives you a snapshot of your availability for credit in the future um, and gives you an idea of how you're perceived in terms of, of where you're going. Third thing, and again, you don't need a financial planner to do this. You can uh, do this for free, is work out what your goals are. Now, one proviso here, goals are finite um, and your life, um, your, your your life continues post goals, but having a goal in place, keeping an eye on that goal and tracking it uh, is, re is a really important part of your financial plan. I'd suggest that when you're thinking about goals um, is you look at short, medium and long term. Uh, the long term one being financial independence, allowing you to live the life you want for the remainder of your life without ever worrying about money again. Um, uh, but the medium and short term goals are slightly different. It might be a holiday, it might be a new car, it might be, but plant, mapping that out um, and understanding what money you need to achieve those short, medium, and long term goals is, is really easy. And I suppose the last one I want to talk about is um, self educate. So uh, I, I've certainly learned a lot. Um, through, uh, and I'm a great believer in lifelong learning. I've learned um, and forgotten a lot about from reading books. Um, now, that may not be your learning style of choice, but you know, whatever you want to learn now is available on YouTube um, uh, or, or podcast. There is so much good resource out there. I like reading, uh, but the amount of free resources available out there for you to learn and understand more about money uh, is huge. I suppose one proviso on that, and one important thing to bear in mind is uh, um, make sure that you're learning the right lessons 
as opposed to the lessons that uh, talk about quick wins. The journey to wealth, in my experience, and from working with clients who have sort of gone through that journey uh, over the past few years, is um, you know sometimes it's boring, sometimes it's slow, sometimes it's uh, it's not the stories we hear on uh, on YouTube ads about Lamborghinis and and um, sitting on a beach. It's all about putting the work in, having really good financial habits. And making sure that we're in a position where we just gradually, incrementally build our businesses to build wealth, build build uh, um, money that we've got in other assets, and just slowly uh, build a plan to get to to, to where we want. So I, I I suggest an element of caution in terms of uh, who you listen to, but uh, what I'm going to talk about now is effectively five books, five stone cold classics, uh, personal financial books that you should consider reading today, I believe, really important. So first one I like is uh, The Richest Man in Babylon. It's it's old, um, and but what I like about it, and I'm a very, uh, I, I love storytelling. I think storytelling as a way to communicate uh, important practical points is a really good way to do it. And the richest man uh, in Babylon is full of stories. Fairly simple parables about money, uh, but certainly um, worth a read um, uh, to, to get you there. Um, the, other, the other thing, and again, this goes back to the point I was making earlier about the perception of wealth, the natural wealth is The Millionaire Next Door by Thomas Stanley and William Danko. And there's a story in that that's really funny um, about uh, so Thomas Stanley and William Danko wanted to do research on what wealth looked like. So they invited a bunch of millionaires to, a, uh, to an event um, and put on caviar and champagne. Uh, but everybody went to the burger and the hot dogs now uh, and beer. Now, Effectively, what that meant is that William and Thomas, their perception of what wealth looked like was actually different to, to what the individuals involved um, uh, were like. And I think the book clarified for me, and certainly my experience with clients is, is fair, fairly similar, is what we perceive as wealth and what is actual wealth are two completely different things. And the habits and practices that people who have achieved financial independence and achieved wealth look a little bit differently to what we expect. So for me, that was, uh, that was worth taking a look. Uh, a Stone Cold Classic financial book is uh, Rich Dad, Poor Dad, Robert Kiyosaki. Um, certainly um, that element of uh, pay yourself first is the big thing for me for this book. That element of saying, you know, actually, instead of spending first and saving what's left, looking at um, uh, paying yourself first, making sure that you're saving for your financial future and using those assets wisely wisely is is really good now you know there's certain elements as in all of these books that i might disagree with uh, but reading it and taking that one tip that one idea that one thing that's going to give you an insight to improve your financial future and achieve financial independence is where you want to go with this so so again you know be a magpie pick the ideas that are going to work Pick the ideas where you go, that's really interesting, and, uh, and and go from there. The other one I want to talk about is a book called The Automatic Millionaire. And this one was, uh, was I think, the one that had the most positive impact in my own journey to wealth. Okay, So The Automatic Millionaire is all about making life easy for yourself when it comes to uh, your journey and effectively automating your contributions into whatever you decide to use as a vehicle to achieve wealth. Um, the psychology of saving regularly and making sure that you're, uh, you're, you're doing that is hard. Um, if you choose to do it in a manual basis, because it takes mental energy to make decisions to make that contribution on a regular basis. And one thing I do is make sure that um, 
uh, all of that sort of stuff, all of my contributions into my pensions, all of my contributions into savings for the kids and all of that is done without me thinking about it. Now, the bit that I do think about, I do this on a regular basis, is how we increase it. So, uh, number one, we want to make sure that it continues to achieve achieve the goals we need to. And I want to make sure that I'm saving as much tax as possible in order to do that. So, c contributing uh, uh, is automatic. I then go in and say, well, actually, I'm going to increase it by this, this amount for this period of time. Uh, but certainly, the I don't want to think about once a month, once a quarter, paying money in, I want it just done. I just want the mental energy it takes to to, to do that off my plate, on somebody else's, uh, 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 and, and, and done by systems and processes. And if you run a business, it's exactly the same, isn't it? It's like so we can't make... You know, every single decision in our business, every single time. That's why we build systems and processes, employ people to run those systems and processes uh, on a regular basis. And it's exactly the same when it comes to our own personal finances. What systems and processes can we use to make our life easier, to, make, uh, to reduce the mental energy it takes to make those day-to-day -day regular decisions uh, and uh, achieve our goals? And then I suppose the last one is one that I really enjoyed. It's called The Behaviour Gap by Carl Richards. Um, again, it's an exploration of the psychological factors you need to consider when we make our uh, uh, decisions. And it's a book really about bias, bias, because we're all biased in a lot of different ways. And it's about making sure that we, we're aware of those biases so we can think differently about achieving our financial goals. So what we've done today is talk about um, some changes to your workplace pension scheme. The Chancellor has announced that you need to be aware of uh, and, and you may want to take action on by just simply reviewing where, where your money is invested in your workplace pension scheme and whether you're happy with the proposals the Chancellor is making and whether you need to make any changes. That was part one. Um, part two was five things that you can potentially do to, 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 to take small steps to get really clear on your financial plan without ever seeing a financial planner. Hopefully that was useful. And then uh, I've talked about the five books that I'd recommend you read uh, so that you can just educate, be more aware of, of what financial independence looks like for you. Think about that. Um, and they're just the, the, what, the books that are um, available um, just, you know, for a low cost and certainly um, certainly available. Now, Raz, can you just share the... Um, if you can just share the presentation for me again, that'd be great. Um, so they're the books. Um, and uh, what I also want to do as well is highlight the fact that on the Cervelo website, which you can find at www.cervelofp.com. Let me, let me try again. Cervelo, C-E-R-V-E-L-L-O-F-P.co.uk. Um, there's loads of additional information on that. So what we've tried really hard to do on the Zavello website is make sure that you've got so much good information for you to get educated, get informed, learn more, give you ideas, uh, look at uh, options and alternatives. And, and on the website, you've got reads and articles, you've got videos, you've got all the videos from these Zavello lives. You've got a wide range of content on there. I'd suggest that you take a look at that. Um, and one thing, one thing uh, we're really, really proud of is Raz. Can you stop sharing the screen? Uh, one thing we're really, really proud of is the fact that um, one one of the things that we've got on the Savello website is a really transparent cost calculator for our services. So we we're really proud of the value we add to our clients' lives. Um, I. I'm really grateful that I get up every morning and help people get to a point where they can live the lives they want uh, by helping them achieve financial clarity. I'm super proud of the work we do. Um, 
uh, but there is a cost associated with working with us uh, and we want to make sure that we're super transparent about that cost so that you if you wanted to have a conversation about working with us can make an informed choice so what we've done is we've built uh we've built a page on the website that has both everything you get from a service uh like Savellos and 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 the things we promise we're going to do for you so you know what you're going to get uh together with the costs associated with working to Savello that's transparent as well but in addition to that we've built a cost comparison calculator and what we've said is according to the fca research and we've used fca data to 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 show this here's how we compare cost wise not to every advisor in the market and i'd suggest that if you're thinking about working with an advisor you might want to do a bit of due diligence on individual advisors and what they charge but here's how we compare to what the fca says is the is the average cost um, and here's what we compare to a typical uh, tired advisor. So, so that then gives you a, a cost comparison. Just to be clear, we're not going to be the cheapest option uh, in a lot of occasions for a lot of clients, but our idea is that we uh, deliver transparency and good value when we have that conversation with our clients. I think that's it for today. Uh, hopefully you've got a uh, lot of value from the uh, tips that I've shared and the elements that we've discussed. Uh, if there's anything that um, I've mentioned that you'd like to speak to me about, uh, feel free to email me, chris, C-H-R-I-S, at cervellofp.co.uk. Um, have a lovely day, and uh, I look forward to engaging with you soon. Bye.